today on UVA Legends Podcast, I have my old pal, Beth Ridley, um, who I haven't, I haven't seen in very many years, except for a couple of alumni events. Uh, Beth is a leadership expert, a consultant, entrepreneur. She's done so much other things as well, we'll talk about. But Beth, great to see you. Thanks for doing this. Oh, oh my God, my pleasure. I was like honored when you reached out because I've been seeing what you're doing and I was like, why does he want to talk to me? What do I do? But anyway, and it's an excuse to catch up, so. It's a great excuse, but you know, other you've, you've done a lot of stuff, but you have great media work yourself. And I, I, I watched some of your videos in preparation yeah. of this and you are awesome. I mean, you know, your brother gets a lot of plaudits for his entertainment chops, but I think I think you can give him some competition for, uh, for definitely for work in front of the camera. Oh, thanks. You know, <laughs> you do what you got to do. Do what you got to do. Yep. Yeah. So, well, let me give you uh, brief sketches of your bio, which is substantial. We, we may be here a while. Yep. You're, you're 91 grad at uh, UVA. You're an uh, English literature um, major, I believe. Um, yeah. The yeah, best degree, I, I have a lot of degrees, let me tell you, but it's the English literature degree that I use every single day, the most valuable one I have. That's, I'm a big believer in liberal arts. I know our, our kids are both at UVA, my son's econ, and I'm I'm glad. I mean, yeah. a lot of folks like their kids to take jobs, uh, degrees where they'll get jobs right away. Whereas, uh, you know, li liberal arts, your your path is kind of uncharted. Um, yeah. But, but and you, you, you develop critical thinking skills, which is transferable to any job. Exactly. And writing skills for what you're doing, especially. Mm -hmm. um, but you're also a Columbia MBA. Uh, yeah. Tufts, you got a master's in international relations. Um, after, after school, uh, you spent time in, in Japan uh, teaching English, as your famous brother John did as well. Interesting. Yeah. Also in Japan, uh, John Ridley, the uh, Oscar winning uh, director of uh, 12. Oh, I love the movie. 12 Years, 12 asleep. years is Asleep. 12 years I asleep. like to say the comedy. What's that? I like to say the comedy. You know, I started out as a comedian. So I was like, John, you've lost your comedy roots. But yeah. Exactly. exactly. I watch movies I like, I watch 50 times. That movie I watch once. Yeah. As, great, exactly. as good as it is, I'm never going to relive that movie again. But anyway, uh, so you moved to, Th you were to Thailand, you did some management consulting in Thailand. Um, and then you went to South Africa, much like a guy I interviewed uh, a few months ago, Mike Finley. Uh, oh did, yeah, Mike. We used to hang out in South Africa for sure. Oh, yeah. Sure, Mike. 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 Mike's a great guy, as you know. Yeah. Um, you uh, established uh, a sales operation of a of a, of a major company, uh, director of, of of business activities. Um, then you came back. Uh, you did you worked at Booz Allen as a management consultant between two thousand and two thousand three. Um, With Porsche. And no, wait, Portia didn't go to UVA. Never mind. Scratch that. Delete that. What's Portia's last name? She went to Columbia with me. Never mind. I'm, I, like I said, I went to so many schools, I'm getting them confused. I don't know. You know who went to? Um, never mind. Forget what's, it. what's Portia's last name? Archer. Oh, uh, no, I don't know. We had a Portia at UVA, though, but I can't remember her last name. Um, anyway, then you went You went uh, the Greater uh, uh, Milwaukee Foundation Program Director. Um, then you went to Northwest Mutual. Um, from 2007, 2019, you went full on corporate uh, vice president of planning and integration. Uh, you worked with client experience, sales, training, diversity. Yep. Um, you have an amazing podcast, uh, Brim Life Pod, inspiring stories of CEOs. Um, and you did a lot of appearances on local media, um, local television in M Milwaukee. Yeah. Um, and then you also start, started the uh, Ridley Consulting Group uh, yeah. uh, uh, doing a DEI, uh, you, you're helping companies um, integrate DEI, jumpstart uh, DEI. Uh, Beth, did I get most of that correct? Yeah, that kind of sums it up. I feel like I'm 100 years old, but that's that was that's a nutshell. Yes, you've done a lot. Well, you you look like you're 30, so you you oh. look the exact same as as I, I I remember you. But let's let's talk DEI now because let's let's start off there. It's a hot topic. Um, yeah. You know, when I watched one of your videos today, one thing that you you made evident is that DEI is more just race and gender. Race yeah. is how it's used as a political issue. You talked about uh, DEI diversity as in diversity of also political uh, beliefs and um, diversity of experiences, diversity in so many different ways, the way you graphed yeah. it out. What, what, what do you think, what do you think of DEI as being? I mean, it, well, un, un, unfortunately, the three words together have become trigger words, fighting words in some organizations. So I really bring people back to the underlying principles, which is 
every human who enters the workplace place is different. We're all diverse. We're made up of all sorts of different identities and backgrounds, right? I think we can all get behind that. And then we all want to feel like we belong and we matter and people value us for who we are. We don't have to have to work extra hard to fit in. Um, there's like one way to be at work. And so that's the inclusion piece. And then the equity is just, we can be more flexible than just one size fits all. What worked for most may not work for everybody. And I think we have so many examples of how we've been able to do that since the pandemic. You know, we have more flexibility than we ever have in terms of, are you working fully remote or in-person or hybrid? Um, so I think when you break it down like that to its bare concepts, most people can get around with it. And what I like to remind leaders is, Gone are the days when you have the luxury of only hiring and managing people who look, think, act just like you. I mean, those are gone are the days, right? Most companies are struggling to hire talent and they have to cast wider nets. So inevitably, to be a good leader, you have to be able to create the environment for everyone to thrive, not just some people, not just the people that you like, not just the people that you're comfortable with. So I really bring it down to it's more of a leadership competency. I don't even use those words because for some people it's a non-starter, but you know, I use different words to bring them into the conversation. And there's nothing that I just said that no leader would be like, oh, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, it's, oh, just tell this one story really quickly because it, it's sure. sort of is representative of like my approach. Um, I do a lot of like leadership discussions and facilitations in companies. And there was this one leader in this one company, he refused to come to anything, like refused to come to anything that was scheduled. And finally he had to show up and HR talked to him about it afterwards. They're like, well, how did you like that session? He goes, oh my God, I loved it. And they're like, but why didn't you want to go? He goes, oh, I thought it was going to be DEI. <laughs> it, you know what I mean? So it's just all about the positioning. It really is all about the positioning. And it's unfortunate that we had to come this, you know, get to here. However, I don't care because the concepts are just not going away. Um, we just have to be more strategic in terms of how we equip companies to be able to, you know, hire and recruit and retain talent. Yeah, that reminds me of something I tell my son all the time, who's, who's at UVA as, as is your, your daughter. Um, he, he'll ask me about discrimination now and discrimination when I was a kid. And how is it, how is it different? How's racism changed? And when I say when I was at UVA, there was a notion of um, things have to change, but they can't change too fast. And it's not government's role to change them. But there was a general acknowledgement that things needed to be more diverse. African-Americans needed more opportunity. African-Americans had been, had been aggrieved. But there was, a, there was always there was a sense that, guys, we can't move too fast. And it's not government's role. But no one questioned the underlying premise that there was racism and then that African-Americans have been held back. I feel now, I do think generally people are more comfortable with race the, if, in, in the metropolitan areas in Milwaukee, sure. DC, people are more comfortable with race. People are more comfortable with alternative lifestyles. People are more uh, comfortable um, with uh, um, a gay, gay and lesbians. No, no problem. Um, but I, but I feel like a lot of people have been empowered to stand up to diversity to be against that, and that wasn't cool when I was young. It was almost yeah. no one was proud to be like that. It was like, well, you know, we can't go too fast. I right. feel now there's a general pushback yeah, to some of the things that need to be done. You know, and unfortunately, I think it's a um, small minority that's super vocal. And yes, they've gotten a lot of power and a lot of influence and they intimidate people. Um, but the facts still show, right? I think there was like a Washington Post survey. Most employees, when you explain, you know, what I just described, you know, the benefits of diversity, equity, inclusion, highly support it, especially the younger generation. And this is why, honestly, I'm not that worried. Um, stuff will pan out. I know a lot of companies are like backing away from a lot of DEI initiatives. And a lot of them happen to be companies that aren't doing so red hot anyway, <laughs> have a lot of diversity. And so, you know, diversity brings better decision making. Um, Harley in my own hometown in Milwaukee is an example. They canceled everything DEI, everything, even supplier diversity. But when you look at them, they're struggling anyway. And so now they've just made it harder for themselves in terms of attracting top talent. And by the way, people with good ideas. So 
I'm not that worried. I always tell my clients, you let those companies do what they do. They're actually making it easier for you. And I mean, I have a business, you know, supporting companies who still care about this and there are plenty. I think, unfortunately, there are a few loud voices. And unfortunately, there have been a lot of loud voices that have infiltrated UVA. And I think it's unfortunate. Um, and, you know, I think my daughters have a very different experience there than I did. And uh, not so sure she would recommend other people going there, which doesn't help, you know, so. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I can't I can't wait to uh, um, to, to talk about that. So we'll, we'll definitely get back to that. Um, you know, you, you were saying there's other ways to refer to DEI so you can get to the substance without without uh, people raising without without raising their eyebrows or, yeah. or raising the hair on their back. Um, how we say it. Um, what are some of the other terms you can use to begin the conversation without scaring people off? Uh, I start with belonging because it is a human, you know, it's a shared human universal experience. We all want to feel that sense of connection and um, value. So uh, an acceptance that's belonging, everybody can relate to it and everybody has something about them where they don't feel that they belong. So it's again, everybody can relate to it and most people can engage there. Um, instead of using the word diversity, I just use differences. I mean, go figure, right? But for whatever reason, people can wrap their head around, yes, everyone's different. Like, there's no argument there. Some differences make more of a difference than others, yes. But, you know, um, people can, um, in, I still use inclusion, but I also make sure people really appreciate the difference between being polite and professional and being truly inclusive. Um, I live in the Midwest, so we've got a lot of that Midwest nice going on. And people be like, we're inclusive, we're so nice. And that's when you dig a little bit further, it's like, well, you're just sort of tolerant of differences, right? And then they can sort of get that. And then instead of equity, I use um, uh, just flexibility, right? We're, again, where can we be flexible? And these are generally no brainers. Um, and my clientele is pretty conservative. I work a lot in construction, a lot in engineering and financial services. These are really pretty conservative organizations and they know, or at least their leaders know, they can't continue to fuel their growth by alienating 50% of the population in the case of construction and engineering. Um, they just see the demographics. And by the way, it's not even like uh, women or people of color who are changing the culture. It's just the young people who are coming in and when they're filling out their HR paperwork, they're asking where do they put their pronouns. <laughs> and it throws my it throws my clients into literally a tailspin. But you know what? They change and they allow the optional use of pronouns because they don't want to lose this talent. And I always joke, I say my clients make the biggest progress with inclusion and belonging when the interns come. They want to impress those interns and when the interns come back. And interns have no problem telling you what they like and what they don't, because what do they care? If they don't like it, they won't come back. They have choices. So, you know, in some regards, I feel like we're twisting ourselves up in knots around, you know, DEI, you know, we either have it where they're committed or not. When I think the next generation are just, progress will happen because the youth is just used to it. You know, they, they just don't, they don't make a big deal about it, but they do vote for it with their feet. Yeah. So, well, well Beth, I sell to law firms. I sell uh, lit litigation support services and we tend to do better under a democratic administration because um, they, they're, they're more aggressive in their enforcement and which creates well, litigation and creates lots of need for temporary attorneys and data management, which is what I sell. So we always, we generally vote Democrat. Um, you know, obviously, uh, with the election coming up, uh, is it a really big deal for you for the Democrats to win as well? Because you just figured if the Republicans win, all these conversations become much more difficult. You know, I don't know. I, I, I mean, for me personally, I hope the Democrats win. Um, but from a business standpoint, I just don't know. You know, um, when there is, I think a lot of um, my clients, it's unsettling for them. And so they need help. That's good for business. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, in some regards, 
I kind of appreciate all this, you know, talk about diversity because like, as far as I'm concerned, no news is, you know, all news is good news and bad news is, is good PR. It's getting, this, this topic continues to be relevant, relevant in new ways. Right after George Floyd, it was more like, oh my God, we got to do something. And now it's, oh my God, what do we do? Either way, they need a consultant. Um, what will, I don't know. I mean, again, I don't know how you negate everybody in the workforce. Mm -hmm. And so people have a need to show up and want to do their best work to feel valued and not under attack. So I think there's always going to be maybe even more of a need to, how do you do that if, you know, the Republican administration is really under attack and making it very difficult for people to even want to apply, let alone get access and opportunities. So we'll see. I try not to lose sleep over it because what are you going to do? Yeah, exactly. Well, um, well, Beth, on that vein, um, do, do, do clients ever ask your opinion about um, how they can create a workplace um, during an election season when folks are talking about uh, politics. Now, I guess it probably affects things a little bit less now because more people are remote and I guess, you know, I guess political uh, debate would have to be chat uh, <laughs> or over Zoom. But do your clients ever ask you about how, how do you handle political discussions at work? Probably the number one question. Oh, is that right? um, oh. Well, it is because it's a it's a dimension of diversity and it's something that, that's so personal to people. I mean, your political ideology is shaped by your values, beliefs, and backgrounds. So if somebody brings in a funny meme and or a headline and, and you know, I work in a professional organization. So there's, you know, people are not intentionally trying to to make anyone feel bad, but it does happen because what I think is funny and cute and you kind of think you know your colleagues, you don't know them, <laughs> you yeah. don't know them, what they think is funny or cute and then people feel offended or marginalized or belittled or something like that. So it definitely does come up. So it's something I've been talking a lot about and especially, you know, like how to prepare leaders to handle November 6th. I'm probably more worried about November 6th because rest assured, 50%, well, everybody's going to feel some way, right? So some people may feel truly elated with the outcome. Other people will be everything from disappointed to downright angry and scared. So, you know, how do you handle that? And, um, you know, I've been telling leaders, like, there are things that you can do now to set the stage so that people can show up at work and at least focus on work as opposed to all these distractions. And I, I think some of it is just really reinforcing if you've got team values or corporate values around inclusion and belonging, most organizations do. They just don't really talk about it. Now's the time to just read them at the top of the meeting, talk about like why this matters. And then I also like to, instead of like calling out political ideology, I just like to assume everybody's carrying something in their mind when they show up at a meeting, whether their cat was sick and had to go to the vet or you know, they got into a fight with one of their kids. I just always like to remind people of the purpose of the meeting, why we come together, like our shared values, and then just give them 30 seconds to just let go of the last thing that they're thinking about and be present. And I actually started doing that October 8th after the October 7th war broke out between Hamas and, and Israel because I had a mixed team. And I actually knew people had different backgrounds and different religions, but I didn't want to pry and really, and I and it felt awkward to like not acknowledge something that's happening in the world that may be deeply affecting people personally. So I just said, I don't know what to say. So I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to give us just 30 seconds to maybe just I want to acknowledge that we're all maybe have something on our mind, especially when we think about like mental health challenges and give people a chance to just like reflect why we're coming together and the things that unite us from a work standpoint. Um, and that's what has been really appreciated for all reasons. I tell people start doing that now. So it's not weird when you do it on November 6th. Um, and then I think people will feel like even if we don't all agree or are happy with the outcome, at least our little space here at work, you know, it is inclusive of and appreciating that people may have different feelings, but we work together for a reason. And at least while we're at work, we can focus on those commonalities, which actually may be kind of refreshing given everything else that's going on in the world. Yeah. 
Well, that's a, that's amazing perspective. So, you know, most of my job is sales now. And my client who this year has probably been responsible for 50, 60% of my revenue. And also a great friend of mine, um, uh, a, a Jewish guy, you know, one of my best friends, but we, we used to love talking politics. And, you know, he's, I'm far left, but he's even far more left than me. Hmm. But after the October 6th, or was it 7th? Was it October 7th? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, attack, uh, it was very difficult to talk about things that we talked about so easily before. Um, and he, he was extremely sensitive um, about things. And it's funny because, rightfully so. And it's interesting because he was the one who would love to push the envelope on debates generally. But during that time period, um, there, there were um, boundaries that I could not cross and I could feel it. And it's, and it was interesting. And, and since then, um, you know, I've gone out dozens and dozens of times and uh, I guess a little bit of the emotion has subsided. So we, we, we can have a rational uh, uh, ch chat about um, the topic, but during that time, I couldn't, you know, it's something I couldn't bring up. It happens. Um, yeah, I have lots of uh, stories, but I think, you know, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of examples of how we can seek to understand one another, even when we don't agree. I mean, we certainly don't get that in the media. Everybody's shouting. And the point is to always be right and to always learn. And I just sort of learned at a certain point, I cannot change other people's minds. I may not agree with what they're saying. I mean, I literally may have a visceral reaction and I just like, what? But it's I, 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 I cannot change their mind. So why is that my job? I really try to coach leaders, make your, make winning understanding, like just tr tr use a different model. So you don't get so hung up in, I will be right. And the next thing out of my mouth has to be the perfect argument to win you over. Cause in many cases, we just, we can't do that with adults. So wouldn't it be great if winning was, I'm understanding, even though I don't agree. Those are two very different things. I don't have to have you agree with me or vice versa for me to understand. And if I can understand you, I'm actually smarter and wiser. Um, I, admittedly, my husband is better at this than I am. He will watch the other news channel. And at first I was like, oh, turn it off. How can you? But I try to like, you know, practice what I preach, eat, eat my own dog food. I'm up to um, 15 minutes at a sitting to be able to listen to the other news without just wanting to like, you know, run out of the room. And I'm really focusing on, I don't have to agree. So calm down. But what am I, what are they saying? And am I understanding? Uh, because then I feel like I'm, I win. I'm smarter. I'm going to make more thoughtful decisions because these people do exist in the world too. What do you, what do you think that comes from in your husband? Your husband, uh, that's not a typical way to view <laughs> dialogue and debate. So where do you think your husband um, uh, derives that from? Who knows? I don't know. I mean, he, he's from Nigeria and he grew up as a Christian in the, in a, the Muslim part of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So maybe he's used to always the value of bridging differences, perhaps. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe he looks at our U.S. politics from uh, maybe some degree of, of objective difference perhaps and maybe finds it just more interesting of what's going on as opposed to deeply personal because again I think growing up in this country our politics become deeply personal because it represents how we grew up the loved ones in our lives you know what I mean um it's 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 so personal and maybe he just doesn't personalize it that way did you guys meet while you were in South Africa no, no, no. We actually met when I was in Boston. It, he was at law school. I was in graduate school. We moved to New York City and then we started dating. And six months after we started dating, uh, my company moved me to South Africa and it was only supposed to be two years. I mean, sorry, it was only supposed to be two two weeks. It ended up being two years. <laughs> wow. Why did they, so, they move you to South Africa? Um, okay, so I worked for this technology company They called PanamSat. It's since been bought out by Hughes Aircraft, but they would build and launch satellites into the space and sell the capacity to large corporations to for their private data networks or for uh, like ESPN to do international broadcasting. So in 
Africa, our anchor client was, um, God, well, it was TransTel. So the national uh, transportation and communications arm for South Africa. And they wanted to, uh, anyways, they were a client. Um, and so we, they sent me over there to just, you know, spend time with the client. And what we discovered is that, you know, in Africa, face-to-face -face relationship means a lot. And the business was doing well when there was like a face-to-face -face person there. So um, yeah, I ended up staying <laughs> for well, two years. Well. So um, you know, you're talking about how your husband being a, a Nigerian Christian may affect how he deals with um, with dialogue and, and debate. But how is your, 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 the fact that you've lived in Thailand, Japan, South Africa, um, married to an African, how has that informed your business, DEI? Um, have have your has your international experience, um, you think, been a um, been a positive to you and and and, and your work with uh, with with your clients? Oh my God, one hundred percent. And um, so uh, you know, I always thought of diversity as so much broader than the narrow view that we have in the United States. We get so wound up with just race and ethnicity and gender, and that's just a piece of it. There's so much diversity and just in terms of like um, people's relationship to time, which I, you know, again, if you're living in another country, you see things so much more differently. Relationship to silence. In Japan, they're so comfortable with silence. And for me, it was so awkward. I mean, all these little things that matter. And in all those places, I always led diverse, like multicultural teams. And so it was so fascinating to like bring people together around our common business goal, but people are coming at it from so many different perspectives. It just honestly made the work more fun. And I do think it led to more thoughtful decision-making. So I, you know, I've always viewed diversity in the broader sense of the word. And I feel like here we just, um, we, we, I don't know, we, we minimize it and then we turn it into a wedge issue. And it's like, so not how most people around the world really do think of it that way. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Beth, you're naturally, you're, you're, uh, you're naturally a, um, a natural <laughs> in front of the camera. Um, so I, I'd imagine, how have you enjoyed your media work? Now you have a podcast, Brim, Brimful Life. Um, mm -hmm. I, so I watched a few of the episodes that I found on some, some of the uh, material on YouTube. Um, but I also saw some of your interviews with your lo local news um, how have you enjoyed that? Um, do you, um, is that something looking back you wish you would, you would have done more of earlier? Uh, do you enjoy the media work or is it just a conduit for you to get more more clients? It's a conduit to get more clients, but I do enjoy it. And I'd love, if you know anybody, like if you can break me out of Milwaukee, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've saturated Milwaukee. If you can get me on this baby <laughs> show, I'd love to. I was a little like literally my dream job. You know, the funny thing is I actually started out in media crazy. Even when I was in Boston, I had this internship. I worked with, uh, the, I can't remember her name now, Natalie somebody, but she was like at the the uh, the Oprah of Boston. And I was the like an intern producer on the show. I always wanted to work in media. That's how I ended up at the tech, the satellite company. I wanted to work in media and I couldn't. So I ended up with the uh, with the product that supported the media. I've always been like skirting around media. So, you know, I fell into it now because yeah, it promotes my business. And honestly, I do a ton of video for clients because pe people just have a short attention span and they're used to seeing information on TikTok and YouTube. So I do two minute videos to communicate because that's all they can handle. And then I do like, you know, news segments and stuff like that. So it is good for business. But I enjoy it. So yeah, if you if you can get me elevated out, out of Milwaukee. <laughs> yeah. I mean, your work is amazing. So uh, people should go to, to your, they should Google you, but hopefully they also see you on this and, and um, and you know, ask you to do some, uh, I know you do some speaking as well. You do, you do great yeah. stuff. So your brother, John Ridley. So years ago, he used to be on Morning Joe in the yeah. early days. Yeah. And he was, he he's was kind of like- He's been on a little bit more recently. Yes, but he, he yeah. was early, in the old days. He was a black guy on Morning Joe. He was a yeah. guy that he was always on. He was very funny. He he would give it right back to Joe because he's that's Joe Scarborough's got a huge personality. But for some reason, your brother was able to give it right back to him. So I knew. He, and and a one one morning, he mentioned he had a, a sister named Beth who went to UVA, and I was like, that's that's got to be Beth's brother. So that's how I, 
I put two and two together. Now, your, your brother, he really is, is done amazing for himself as a director, writer, and producer. I mentioned earlier, he got an Academy Award, only the second African-American to get an Academy Award for 12 years in The Slave. A lot of Blacks have gotten Academy Awards um, in front of the camera, but behind the camera and also in writing, it's, oh. sometimes it could be tough. He worked on Three Kings. He was a writer for Martin and many other stuff. Um, and he's, he still does so much stuff. I'm going to... A short change, but try to try to read all of it. How has John influenced your media work? When you, is that is that inspires you to want to do more as well? Because John's had such success. I don't know if it. Not, well, I, and I also have an older sister too, so I don't oh. want to leave her out. Oh, so oh sorry. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about no. her after John. Okay. No, 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 no. It's okay. So I'm the youngest of the three. So obviously, of course, I look up to my siblings. You know, I don't know if it's inspired me necessarily specifically for the media work because I think my interest is a little bit different um, than than his interest and in, in his passion. But what it does inspire me is that literally you can do anything. Like I think we were always raised that way. Like. Literally, I mean, we're from Wisconsin, a small little town in Wisconsin. Um, and so my sister is, you know, successful in her own right, worked all of her career on Wall Street, and of course was always used to being like the only one. So I think with them, I I just look at like just this innate confidence that they give me, like if they can do it, and you know, truth be told, I'm smarter than both of them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So there's hope for me. So I think it was just more broadly. And also the other thing is you don't have to be pigeonholed because, you know, within media, he's had a variety of careers. So started out as a stand-up comedian, then he went into writing, then he went into, um, you know, more producing. And so I think that, you know, you don't, and he does radio, you know, films, but then documentaries, TV. So I, you know, he showed me that, you can change your mind. You don't have to be pigeonholed. You're only limited by your own imagination. Yeah. Well, what's also interesting is that John is in the media, whereas a guy like me could just kind of do a YouTube channel and start talking to people. It used to be you had to commit to be in the media and it was kind of an advocation and a profession and you went all out. You may have to have a job on the side, but now the media is different. Media can encompass so much Successful. Other things now. So there's a lot of opportunities for people like yourself who want to promote their, their their business or people like me who just love sports and love my university. So I, I think John is kind of the old school media, whereas the media yeah. of the future, like my, my daughter has a, a YouTube a video with 10 million views and she's wow. she, she's incredibly more successful at this than I am just doing silly, you know, videos, you know, things that she thinks are funny. So it's yeah. just it's, it's interesting how the media is changing drastically. Well, how technology has changed, right? Because like there are actual careers that we couldn't have imagined. Like an influencer right. is a career. It's a career, you know, a YouTube, uh, what does my son want to be? Where, what do you want? A YouTube, um, I don't know, a YouTube video producer or something. Like that's an actual career. Not to mention all the jobs that have spun off around that. You've got people who are experts in how to grow your business on LinkedIn. You've got LinkedIn specialists, that's a career. So it's just amazing how technology has spun off all these cottage industries. And, and I also think, you know, you probably see it in your own kids as I do mine, like they're all very entrepreneurial minded. I think they think, well, working for someone is a path and maybe I'll do that for a little bit, but I am more than prepared to just start my own business. And partly because the technology has made starting a business a lot more affordable and accessible. Yeah. Well, Beth, what was it like growing up in a, in a small town in um, near Milwaukee? I don't remember ever talking about this with you. I didn't know you were from a small, you always seem really big I city kept today. it to myself. You because did. People who did know I was from Milwaukee would always make fun of me. <laughs> so uh, I always kept it to myself. And sometimes I would lie and say I was from Chicago until <laughs> I said that to someone from Chicago. They were like, where, what yeah. part? I was like, uh, Northern suburbs. Because Milwaukee's north of Chicago. Yeah, I didn't advertise that. Yeah. I didn't advertise it. <laughs> yeah. It's like being from, I was from Northern Virginia, and I think at one point I might have said I was from D.C., and someone <laughs> said, you're not from D.C., you're from Northern Virginia. <laughs> so you got you to gotta end it. But did you guys stand out um, being an African-American family in a small town? In, in, in well, Wisconsin? so ironically, no. So I grew up in this town called Mequon. It's like a suburb 
of Milwaukee. It's maybe like 25, 20 minutes north of Milwaukee. But when we moved there in the 70s, it was very rural. So it was dirt roads and it was mostly farmland. My dad um, is a physician, right? Retired, but is an ophthalmologist. And so when they moved into that house in the 1970s, there was like a lot of redlining. So um, a lot of places, you know, neighborhoods, you couldn't, you know, um, buy a home if you were black. Mequon, because no one cared because it was just, you know, the barns and cows, they sold black people homes. And so in our neighborhood, it was like 50% black families, black young professionals, and they called it the golden ghetto. <laughs> so that's how I grew up. Um, it eventually grew because there was a lot of land. All the farmers got bought out. And now it's like mansions. And it's like one of the more wealthier suburbs. But when we were there, it was modest. And it was, you know, farmland. Um, so it's been interesting to see the progression of that. So, you know, it was, I had, it was 50-50. You know, I would say I 50% of my friends were maybe not 50%, but 30% were black. The rest were white. Um, so it, it didn't feel that weird. Um, yeah. Well, your father was an outlier being an ophthalmologist in a, in a, in a rural, in rural Wisconsin. That, that couldn't have been a very common. Well, his office was in Milwaukee. Okay. So yeah, his know. office was in, in, in downtown Milwaukee. So his clientele also, I would say, was also pretty diverse. So he had white patients and black patients and it was pretty diverse. Right. So you guys would hang out in Milwaukee? You guys would party in Milwaukee as a as a teenager? And a, well, once I got my license, yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that was a, it was a long drive back to Mequon, <laughs> back to the country. So, so why'd you decide to go to UVA? Oh, really good question. Um, so uh, I loved English literature uh, in high school, always have. It, UVA has a, a stellar English literature program. I definitely wanted to get out of the Midwest, just experience something different and have a warmer climate. And UVA, when we were there, the golden era, it was the blackest school in the United States. 15% of the undergraduate was black. So it's a shadow of what it was. And that was enough for me, those three things. And it was, um, uh, I would say a mid-sized school. So our you know, University of Wisconsin-Madison, it's like 40,000 students. To me, that felt a little bit big. So it hit all the, uh, the criteria. And I will tell you, showing up, like you probably don't even think Virginia is the South, right? Oh, that was the deep South for me, like coming from Wisconsin. I had never been to the South ever. And so I was petrified. <laughs> but in what way, in what way did it feel Southern to you? It was South. It was yeah, South it, of the Midwest. Yeah, but the, but the way the way people reacted, uh, interacted with you, just the way they talk. Well, now I call it now I call it Mid Atlantic, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, but you know, it's it's it geographically it's more south. You know, to me, having never lived in the south and grew up in the north, I just you know, obviously, I, I my family ended up in the north because they fled the south, right? At, at some point in our family history, and I just heard like horrible stories. So as a child, like the south scared me. I I didn't want to have anything to do with the south, but the school fit all the criteria and all the other ways. So I was like, sort of held my breath and gave it a go. And once I got on campus, it was fine. I never had any Gra uh, grounds. Gra grounds. Grounds. Part of me, it's been a while. I never had any problems. But you know what? The funny thing is, I went to a black school. I went to an HBCU. I barely recall interacting with any white people. Barely. All my friends, you know, and then I pledged the sorority you know, those are the only memories that I have. So I felt very comfortable. You know, it's, it's shocking. And I ask you those questions, not because I'm disagreeing with you, but so I'm from Northern Virginia outside of DC, which we thought was progressive for that time. And, you know, my high school would be four or 5% black. And most of my very, very close friends were black, were basketball players, football players like me. But I was friends with a lot of people. And I didn't think about race that much growing up, mostly government workers, military employees where I lived and the kids were, were comfortable with all kinds. When I went to UVA, it was the first time that I thought about race every day. And like you, I'd walk down the street and I'd only see black faces. I was, I was thinking, it took me a long time to adjust to that yeah. um, because 
I was used, even though blacks are all, black kids are always my, my better friends, I didn't really think about it. I just, it kind of would gravitate um, mm -hmm. that way. But I, but I did adjust. But one thing that was really interesting to me when I really thought about it, I only had one close white friend in, in college. And yeah. I didn't even realize that until I started doing these interviews and I would be more introspective about my UVA experience. But I really yeah. only had one close white friend. We're still friends to this day. All my friends were black. I went to, I yeah. never went to any of the parties, rugby road yeah, or whatever. Never, 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 set, never, never, set, never set foot on rugby road. No. And you know, well, and I want to hear your, it's your son who's a senior or a fourth year there, right? No, he's a, he's a third year. Yeah. A third year. So I want to make sure that there, our kids know each other. So Lola is my daughter. She's a second year. She's mm -hmm. having a really different experience. Um, so she lives with three white girls, number one, right? So again, I... I don't think I knew three white people <laughs> at UVA. <laughs> now it's out of necessity because they don't have many black people. Um, it's a different kind of vibe. I don't know. I can't really explain it. I don't know. It's it. I feel like it's a different. It's a different vibe for her. It's a different era too. So, yeah. I think the what, verdict is still out in terms of if she really likes it or not. Yeah, I, I would think running track would help her though, right? Because you have a little team that you're um, involved fair, in. Fair enough, but I think her her feedback is. The only black people are the athletes, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, what are some of the things that make her un uncomfortable there? Just that there's not a lot of black folks that she can hang, like people that we piled around with. She doesn't have like the parties that we had. I and don't think I don't think she's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I just think you know her words to me were you know. Um, she went to a predominantly white high school and, 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 and was fine. Like, you know, no problems, had friends that were black and white and diverse and everything else. Um, I think she just wanted, um, I just think she just wanted to be in more company with more black people. Now, what I've told her is there are enough black people there. I mean, you know what I mean? Like how many friends do you need? So I do know that she's got really quality relationships. And um, so you remember Tony Covington, her daughter is there. So they're really good friends. Um, and so it's almost like, and they've created this group called Black Girls United. So to me, it's almost because there's so, so few of them, their relationships maybe are closer, which I think can be a really good thing. Mm -hmm. So I think she just, um, I don't know, I think, the first year you're getting settled in anyway. So maybe there was some of that also. But I think as the quality of her relationships grows, maybe she'll start to value it more. Yeah. Well, Beth, uh, how important to your success and career was your sorority? And is it the same today? Like, would, would you recommend, I don't, I don't know if Lola's pledged, I know she's busy, but yeah. is it the same type of, is, is pledge and sorority has the same effect on your relationships and your career as it, did when, when you pledged? Okay, so in full disclosure, and I pray no Deltas watch this, but I would call myself a deadbeat Delta because I haven't paid dues in, since, <laughs> since the day I pledged. Um, you know, I did it for the friendship and not for the professional. I am not active in my local chapter, uh, and I'm sure a lot of Deltas will hate me for this. Um, I'm really, really close to my line sisters, which has been wonderful. I wouldn't trade, that was yeah. worth it, right? Just having those relationships, we text constantly, just having those relationships was worth it, but I never saw it as like something for professional reasons. So I don't tap into it for my professional network. If I happen to run into a Delta, I'm super excited and it gives us something to talk about. Um, but I, I don't do it like that. Maybe with Kamala Harris um, being um, uh, AKA elevating the whole divine nine, um, maybe it'll just elevate all of that. But, you know, I cast my net wide in terms of relationships. I tend not to do a lot of networking just for business. I tend to want to just meet people, good people. And I think good stuff comes from that. And I'm open to meeting amazing Deltas, but I'm not like super, you know, plugged into the organization, I'll just say. Yeah. Well, maybe Kamala can, um, can, uh, Kamala can, can convince you to pay your dues. That'd be one good thing. So, 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 so look, how would you compare your experience at UVA 
to your experience at Columbia and Tufts, kind of snooty. Uh, oh my God. So, what? well, so different. So, so UVA, remember, never been to the South from this small town in Wisconsin. It was just what I needed to build confidence in community with a lot of other Black people who I think had a shared experience as me. Um, so UVA, I feel like was the launching pad. It gave me so much confidence. Um, Tufts was co a completely different, obviously I'm older and it was an international program. So I would say 80% of the students, one were from overseas and maybe only 20% were even from the United States. So that was that. And then Columbia, obviously in New York city. And of course I'm even older than and at that point, it was really more of a utility. I went there specifically so I could work in management consulting. I was actually married. I got married my, my first year there. And you're in New York City. Um, so, you know, each one I feel was so different, but each one was perfect for where I was in my life and what I wanted to get out of it. But out of all of them, UVA, obviously I was young. It was the most formative I would say in terms of my outlook and and my friendships and and everything. Yeah, well, you know, you're you're definitely a salt of the earth type girl, and that you're from the Midwest and from a small town. But when it comes to travel, you lived in exotic places, so it's really strange. It's Milwaukee woman, but when when, when you you know when you travel, it's it's Asia, it's it's South Africa. Because Milwaukee was so boring. Yeah, so <laughs> I mean, honest to God, if I probably lived in New York City, I wouldn't have left. It was so boring. Yeah. Well, how did um, how did your time in Asia, uh, Japan? You were teaching English. Thailand. You were you were in business. Um, how did that affect your life? What did you learn about yourself uh, being in Asia, being a black woman in, in Asia? So Asia, Japan in particular. So Japan, I went right after you. I graduated from UVA, and that also really, really, really scared me. I knew I wanted to live abroad. And Japan just sort of happened. I wasn't targeting Japan. And that really scared me because again, I thought, oh, the Japanese are really racist. <laughs> Here I go. And um, of course, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, I think, you know, I went over there speaking no Japanese, left completely fluent. Um, I still have relationships there today, people I'm still in touch with. What I learned is that you can be half a world away, completely different background and share things in common. Um, loved my experience in Japan. Tokyo is my second favorite city in the world. I'd move there. I'd move there in a heartbeat if the opportunity came up. Right. What, what about Thailand? Yeah, Thailand was fun. So Thailand was a little bit different. I was an employee of Booz Allen out of the New York City office and staffed. On a project at Bangkok, the Bank of Thailand. It's so random. They actually get such a cool location. Yeah, and so um, I was there for almost a year, but I would come back every three weeks, if you believe it or not, just for the weekend, um, just to come back home. Um, so it was a little bit of a different experience. You know, you're you're working as a consultant. You're it's it's a lot of work. So, but I did get to know Thailand. I traveled through most of Southeast Asia, which is just a phenomenal. And um, love the Thai culture, love the food, um, just 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 loved it, loved it. And you know, it's a melting pot. It's really diverse. There's these countries that are so incredibly diverse um, that I don't think we give it credit for. So Thailand is extremely diverse. Kuala Lumpur is diverse in every sense of the word, ethnicity, religion, and people just, you know, there's a lot of harmony there. So I saw a lot of models of like, diversity really, really, really working well. Yeah. Well, well, Beth, you couldn't have picked a more exciting time to be in South Africa. Um, uh, you went there for a two week gig and you're there for a few years. Um, what, what was it like to be there? It was, it was, a, it was an exciting time, probably a, a, a turbulent time, lots of change. Um, and what, what did they make of you, an American uh, businesswoman, a black businesswoman in, in, in South Africa? It's so weird. And I'd love to hear your interview with Mike Finley, who was there at the same time. Um, so it was two years after the end of apartheid, right? So mm -hmm. Nelson Mandela was just elected president. So I was there. It was fascinating to see a country transition from deeply divided apartheid state to a unified democracy. So that was just like fascinating. It was also a, a challenge. You know, I fell in this weird bucket. So white South Africans 
loved me and race was not an issue because they saw me as an American and their country was opening up for the first time. And so they were just happy to have people from outside of South Africa. And when you hear your American accent and they think dollars, all of a sudden you're a rock star. Like I wouldn't need reservations at a restaurant. I remember one time my VCR broke and I had gone to like their version of Best Buy. And the guy was like, I will come to your house and fix it there. And he did white dude and then left. And, you know, he's like, no problem. Like, so you're treated like this. Then the black South Africans, I think were somewhat suspicious and rightly so feeling like the influx of black Americans taking advantage of these opportunities that were opening up, you know, taking away their opportunities that they died for essentially. So I can see it on all sides, but the problem is, and Finley maybe had a different experience than me. I felt a little isolated. You know, I felt a little, you know, it was kind of hard to like really be friends with white people. Cause at the same time, they're embracing me. They're saying horrible things about black South Africans. So I can't jive with that. Then the black South Africans, while they're friendly towards me, occasionally they'll say stuff like, don't tell your friends to come here. <laughs> wow. Don't tell, don't tell. And you're like, yeah. Um, so I did feel a little bit like man eh, in the middle, um, but the country is beautiful. The people are beautiful. It had so much potential. The one thing that I, I didn't like and the reason why I didn't stay is it had a very permissive gun culture. You could carry your guns everywhere. I'd be out to lunch with people and they'd be like, want to see my new gun? I'm like, not really. <laughs> um, there's armed security guards everywhere. I did not feel safe. I didn't feel safe, not because of the violence that people were protecting themselves for, but because of the display of guns. And I'm like, I don't know, one could drop and shoot off. Like, uh, you know, um, so I, I, decide, I decided to leave that, that job and I came home to New York City and felt so free felt so safe. And I always thought to myself, I hope America never becomes like that. And then lo and behold, I do think we are with our gun culture. It's kind of overtaking. And now I, I feel like I felt in South Africa, uh, just in terms of the paranoia of the presence of guns all around don't make me feel safer. They make me feel a little bit like a, a little on edge always. Yeah. And, and, and Beth, you were married when you went to South Africa. Is that right? No, I was dating. So we dated long distance. He, my husband was in New York and I was in South Africa. So, so what did, did he come visit South Africa a lot? He came once. I went home once in two years. He came once in two years. Now, mind you, he's Nigerian. So I, for over that course of the two years, I worked hard to lobby for the African to move to Africa because I loved my job. Uh, but he yeah. had his reasons why he did not. He worked hard to come you know, to the United States and become established. And so um, you know, I decided to move home. And then when I moved back to New York, that's, we got married after I moved back home. How did he view apartheid and what came after? It, uh, being a Nigerian, um, I guess they had been, they had been a, a Commonwealth country, you know, 40 years ago or so, but uh, they had a different path, obviously, in South Africa. So how did he view it much differently than, than we would view it, uh, the, the South African, um, the, the end of apartheid and what came after? I never asked him. <laughs> Maybe your next episode. Your Maybe we were too busy with wedding planning and then having babies. So yeah. I it, I never asked. I'm going to ask and I'm yeah. going to get back to you after the show. Yeah. So, yeah. Make, yeah, make sure I get credit. Uh, yeah, make sure, yeah, I will. Uh, did, did, you, did you learn anything about inclusion, diversity? Yeah. You have, yeah, you have the color, you have, you have the color, I guess they call them the cape color. I mean, you have, you have, the Indian, yeah, you have all these different people in South Africa. Uh, did you learn about um, diversity there? there? So here's what I learned, right? So there, they were at that time, obviously way more divided than than we are in the United States, right? I mean, uh, you know, they were coming from war, uh, apartheid. And um, what was fascinating because it was so real time, you know, I, I am not old enough to really remember the civil rights. I have to live it through my parents. But there, it's almost like you're in you're in the middle of the civil rights. So, I had clients who would have coworkers on one, you know, black coworkers on one side of apartheid, who and their uncle was killed by a white coworkers, you know, someone in their family. It's that close, 
You know what I mean? It was that immediate. Yet they're showing up for work. So I found it fascinating. Here's what I thought was really smart about South Africa that went towards the healing that I wish we could have done, or maybe we can still do here in the United States. Um, you know, Desmond Tutu established the whole Truth and Reconciliation Commission with the belief that, you know, if people can tell their stories, we can appreciate the shared trauma of apartheid. There are no winners here. Uh, and then we can move forward with a collective vision for the future. So it was this whole series of people coming together through community centers or whatever, and just sharing their stories about life under apartheid. Sometimes perpetrators of crimes and the victims of crimes would come together and there was not to be any retribution or retaliation. It was just sharing and listening and again, seeking to understand. And so you would listen to these stories and you would just, you know, you couldn't help but be moved by the shared humanity of loss, you know what I mean? For everybody on all sides. Um, and I think it did, South Africa is not perfect, but I do think it was uh, a healing process and it gave people the ability to talk about a very difficult past um, so that you can at least talk about it. Uh, we never did that here. And so I feel like we, like, why can't we talk about race? Like, why is, why is that so divisive? I think we've never had a, a model of collectively as a nation talking about a past and just reconciling, you know, you can, two things can coexist at the same time. The bad and the good can coexist at the same time. And they did happen in history. We just can't talk about it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to argue with you, but I will say between 1965 with LBJ and Great Society and 1980 when Reagan took office, there was a time when we accepted affirmative action. We, and maybe it was because of the assassinations too. Uh, there, there was a movement um, to, to create a truly multicultural society and, and have equity. And I think it was a sh very small window, unfortunately, that didn't last very long. But I think we did have we did have our moment, and um, unfortunately, um, I, I I think it's it's over. Hopefully, we we, we can bring it back. Um, yeah, a moment might come back, and and restoration I think was also a moment, yeah. but maybe moments that weren't really capitalized. Yeah, yeah. Well, Beth, I do want to move along and and ask you a little about about corporate America. So. Um, you, you, you achieved, you did great at uh, Northwest Mutual. Before that, you were, we talked about you were at Booz and you worked for in Milwaukee at a foundation briefly as well. Um, so it seems like whatever you tried, you did really well. Uh, what are some, and, but, but now you're an entrepreneur and I, I tend to think, listen to what you said earlier, that's where you belong. Um, yeah. It better be, because that's where you are. That's where you that's are now. Exactly. So, so, so when you think about the corporate world, what are some of the things you liked and didn't like about the corporate world? Hmm. I liked working with really smart people and learning from, you know, really smart peers. I really liked the opportunities that all those positions afforded me, like the travel, the exposure to new people, to new places. You know, I always thought of jobs never as like climbing the corporate ladder, but as the experiences that I get and the people that I get to meet. And so I feel like with all those jobs, I stayed in them because I think the experiences, learning that I got and the people that I met was really fulfilling. Right. So you, you look back on those as, as good times. They're great. They're good. Oh, yeah. Work. All of those jobs. All yeah. of not to say I didn't have uh, challenging moments, but the arc of all of them, um, huge uh, huge respect for those companies and a very enjoyable timeline was there. Yeah, so when you, when you look ahead and um, and we, you talked a little bit about media stuff around the country because they're, they're getting tired of you in, in Milwaukee. Um, <laughs> what are some of the things you would like to accomplish going forward? Obviously, continue to grow your business at Ridley, Ridley Consulting, yeah. but what are some of the other things you'd like to accomplish in, in your career? Yeah, I still have a ways to go. I have still things I'm envisioning for my business. So that, um, you know, I I think we're at an era now where a lot of women um, executives are choosing to leave the workforce and to become entrepreneurs for a variety of reasons. 
And I did it. And I have a lot of experience. People ask me for just guidance and experience anyway, if they're thinking about leaving or if they've recently left to become entrepreneurs. And so I really want to help more women be successful that way. So that's something that I'm really passionate about that I want to do either informally or perhaps a little bit more formally. That, and honestly, I, I, I want to start traveling more. So I will be an empty nester in two years. My youngest is a junior in high school. And I want to position myself where I can live like um, three months in a different place around the world. Cause I really, really, I haven't really traveled much since, you know, raising kids. So I really, really just want to start traveling more and do something more international. Yeah. Well, at least you got your traveling done before you had kids. You did. Yeah. You, you, did, some, you did some amazing job. All right, Beth, this has been great. Last, last, um, last question. Um, if, if you had to give a young Beth Ridley advice and, or maybe, you know, things you could have done a little bit differently, uh, does anything come to mind of things you wish you would have done a little bit differently in your career? Yeah, I guess, and this is not even young Beth. This would be like now Beth. <laughs> uh, to maybe, you know, not worry so much. I worry a lot, especially mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur. I probably am like off the charts worrying, right? Um, but to just maybe like don't see things as a, a failure if it doesn't go the way I expected, but more of like, what did I learn? And just be more curious and, and sort of repla re replace um, worry with curiosity. Instead of saying, oh, I'm worried that this will happen. Be like, I'm curious what might happen. And just sort of look at life that way. And that just, you know, worry less, be more curious and just be more present in the moment. I think I'm a bit of a striver where I'm like, never happy, always more. And maybe just slow down and just try to like savor what is, even if it's not perfect. So I feel like young Beth probably had had that down pat. Like, you know, you get, <laughs> old, you get old and then you have to have like real responsibilities and kids and all that stuff. I think old Beth probably took my starts to take myself maybe a little bit more seriously than I need to. So that's probably advice that I would give Beth today. Yeah, that's probably good advice. Uh, for all of us, because I, I, you know, I'm an entrepreneur and in, in sales, and we're, we're overly sensitive about everything that happens, everything out of a client's mouth, everything out of a prospect's mouth. We worry. That's just that's just kind of the life. Uh, but it's I could can, can definitely identify with that. Well, look, Beth, this has been great. Thank you so much for for doing this with me. I can't wait to uh, um, to catch up with you again in person next time. Thanks. Uh, you, you, keep in touch. Bye bye. Okay, I will.